welcome back to another episode of Endurance Icons, where we sit down with individuals making an impact in the world of endurance sports. We got a great guest for you today, someone I was luckily lucky enough to meet in Kona when I was there this year, and I really hit it off with him and love everything he's doing. But we got the co-founder and performance nutrition coach at Fuelin. We got Scott Tyndall on the podcast today. How you doing, Scott? Very well, Mark. Thanks for having me. Uh and yeah, I can second that. It was fantastic to meet you and uh, your little posse of friends uh, out in uh, Kona. A very worthwhile. Where were we? Fast Twitch? Yeah, yeah. Slow Twitch party. A slow gotta, twitch. I always call it Fast Twitch. Slow twitch. <laughs> I always call it Fast Twitch and everyone's like, it's Slow Twitch, man. <laughs> this not, we have no Fast Twitch fibers left in Iron Man. Come on. <laughs> well, I don't know. The way it's moving, they're certainly, uh, they're certainly getting faster. So we could probably argue against that. But uh, yeah, yeah no, it was it was super fun uh, being in Kona at the time. And I think as we both agree, you know, I think going to those big events, it's it's not the initial return on investment that you see. It's the connections and that human to human element, which is so fantastic. And you, you build relationships like we have and, uh, you know, get the opportunity to come on the, your show as a result. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, Kona's really like that mecca of connection. I've never gone to a place like that and just met so many amazing people that I'm just like, I need to have all these conversations with like, and just lining yeah. those up since Kona, but what a magical place, totally. It was pretty funny, like yeah, you and your friend Cody and I was in, in the party and we were just so standing around. I think I was grabbing a beer, probably a non-alcoholic one, low calorie, something like that. <laughs> and uh, you, you two walked up and were like, oh my God. And I felt like a quasi celebrity at that point in time, although I'm definitely not, but you two made me feel very special. And you're like, Oh, I've heard you talk before. And I was like, Oh, really? So it was, it was very flattering. And, uh, and then obviously you got talking to me and we just realized that I'm just a regular Aussie and uh, someone who works, who's lucky enough to work with uh, a bunch of very talented athletes and yeah, set up, I guess, a, a pretty cool company in doing so. And it's, uh, it's definitely a, a great lifestyle choice. Yeah, it was so cool. I think like I had heard of you many times before that, but one of the pieces Cody and I had really connected on um, when we saw you, they were like, wait a second, like he did some work with the Maple Leafs and like, we're all like, we're Canadian and like, that's our team. So what did you do a little bit with the Leafs? Could you give us a little rundown of, of what that kind of looked like in your time there? Yeah, I was a uh, head well, performance nutritionist for the Leafs, uh, 2018 season. So I think it was uh, John Tavares' first season coming in. Nice. Uh, you had uh, Freddie and I think oh, a lot of the boys, a lot of them have left now, actually, uh, from when I was there. It's obviously a few years ago. It's, it's amazing how quickly time flies, but yeah, I was brought in uh, by Jeremy Battle and Matt Herring, who were the performance coach and strength and conditioning, head of strength and conditioning, respectively. Um, and uh, yeah, they brought me in as as a, a non-hockey guy, I guess. And it was probably the thing that I heard over and over again was, you're not a hockey guy. And I was like, it doesn't matter if I'm a hockey guy. Like I've worked in rugby, I've worked in cricket you know professional sailing with america's cup all those sorts of things like it's the principles that need to be applied and i think when you look at the leafs it was pretty sad state of affairs to be honest like i was pretty shocked at how not not um they're certainly not unprofessional but certainly just the application of a lot of the players to their craft I think in really being professional, I thought was lacking in a, in a number of ways. Um, not all of them. I think some of them were fantastic and there were athletes that really were interested in improving uh, from a new, you know, specifically from a nutrition perspective, but there were a lot that, you know, and that's one of the things in team sports. Nutrition is one of those things that I think because it is a team element, they sort of don't see the importance of it. Although, you know, like any sport, that it certainly has a significant impact on performance totally yeah so it's cool it seems like you've uh you've gone in a couple different places here where you're bringing kind of that realm where you haven't necessarily been so embedded in the sport which is kind of the same that you're bringing to endurance now which i think is maybe why you're making such a a big impact right away um how did kind of your foray into endurance eventually happen yeah it was 
it was 2017 and I was working in Boston at the time at a, a gut microbiome uh, biotech startup. And I had was reached out to by um, Sarah Pian Piano and her coach, Matt Dixon, and was asking whether, I can't remember, uh, the connection came through a friend of mine, Craig McFarland, uh, who I worked with at uh, Oracle. And so he used to be the strength and conditioner for Sarah when they were based in San Francisco for that cup there. And so he, there was that connection there. And then Matt, obviously uh, being Matt sort of put the hard word on me and sort of really questioned everything I was doing. And yeah, he's talked about that recently where he thought I was full of shit um, <laughs> because I was talking about these huge sort of carbohydrate intake numbers. And he was like, that's crazy. No one needs to take in that many calories. And since then, he's obviously said, yeah, I'll swallow my words and uh, actually own it and say that I thought you're an idiot and you've proven me wrong. But uh, and I have a great relationship with Maddie. Um, but Sarah was struggling at the time. She was really struggling with a lot of GI complaints um she had Hashimoto's which is a thyroid disorder and um bit, I, symptoms signs and symptoms of IBS and other things and you know some intolerances to to gluten and dairy and whatnot and so he he wanted me to sort of take a look at her and see if we could do something uh around her uh, nutrition and improving that and I guess because I was working in the gut microbiome by tech startup it was like oh let's focus on that and what i realized was actually it was probably very little well there's certainly a connection there and a correlation with the gut but it went way beyond sort of looking at you know metabolites in her gut it was like taking a big step back and looking at what she was eating on a daily basis and then most importantly what we did focus on was her race fueling and her hydration strategy because at that point in time in 2017, it wasn't really being done. It was sort of all just starting to come out in terms of the research and, uh, you know, higher amounts of carbs where we were looking at mixed formats of carbs. So glucose, fructose and whatnot, and those, um, you know, different forms of carbohydrates in terms of the way they're transported in the gut. We started looking at that and seeing research. And so that's what we started doing with Sarah. And I guess, honestly, like she's, she was, such an integral part of what this program that we now run as fuel in has has really developed into because it was all sort of n equals one with her and then we started to see these changes and then we started applying that to recommendations from her to me and then we started to seeing or well, i certainly started seeing you know significant improvements by getting endurance athletes taking on far more protein which again was pretty unheard of in 2017, which I know sounds probably people are like, really? But yeah, 2017, trying to get an endurance athlete to eat like, you know, two to two and a half grams per kilo of body weight uh, was, yeah, a hard sell. But because everyone was freaking out that they might get big muscles and things like that. Uh, so, so that was a big, big part of it. And obviously the carbohydrates, you know, periodizing carbohydrates based on the training volume and the intensity was a huge part for Sarah in terms of, manipulating her race weight throughout the season and ensuring that yeah you know, we had times where she could really relax and we you know she'd go up to 130 and then she'd race at 118 so and we saw huge changes in in water weight as well with her as a female athlete with menstrual cycle and you know some inflammation post racing and related to her food intake and things like that. So it gave me a really good insight into female physiology as well, where I probably had never focused on that because mm -hmm. every sport I'd been involved in was a male sport, you know, cricket, rugby, sailing, ice hockey. <laughs> like, you know, you didn't have to deal with the menstrual cycle and yeah, we can go off on a tangent about menstrual cycle and nutrition if you want, which is, you know, pretty controversial, but, you know, I certainly have my opinions on it. And we certainly did trial a period of time with Sarah, uh, with manipulating her nutrition based on her cycle. Mm -hmm. Absolutely terrible. Didn't work out. Um, well, I mean, it depends on the training. So first yeah. and foremost, mm -hmm. look, I will do my best not to offend any females out there or anybody who's in the female research space. What I want to say is that it's amazing that the research has improved and there is a focus now on female physiology with regards to nutrition and training. I think that's a huge step in the right direction. 
What is very unclear at this point in time is the implications of that research. And there is no clear effect in terms of manipulating, changing specific nutrition based around the menstrual cycle and performance outcomes. And if you're hearing that and you're saying, no, that's not true, well, look at the science. Like it's not clear cut, despite what some people may be saying. Mm -hmm. It's certainly interesting. And I think we're all taking it on board and females are individual athletes. And I think they need to look at their nutrition on a very much an individual basis, which makes it very hard to scale. Unlike males who just seem to cope with whatever we, you know, give them, it's much easier to program probably for males. And I think females within a system still need to be tweaking their program. But what I would say is, and so that's the first point, I think in around the menstrual cycle, yes, women will deal with the follicular phase and the luteal phase in differing ways. And yes, you'll probably, some women will feel worse in that later part, in that luteal phase. But you do not want to go and eat high fat and low carb in that period just because your menstrual cycle tells you if your training involves high intensity mm. and high um, you know, threshold work because you're going to absolutely fail. And you need to remember also that your racing uh, you know, calendar is not going to be built around your cycle. Mm. So you may have a race that falls in that luteal period and you need to be ready to deal with that at that. And if you haven't trained for that, and if you're on a high fat, low carb diet, because that's what your cycle predetermines you to be best at, you're going to find it very, very difficult. So I think first and foremost, base your nutrition around your training, regardless of what your cycle is. If your cycle impacts you so much, speak to your coach about manipulating your training program to facilitate your cycle, not the other way around. And that's hopefully that's pretty clear. You might get a few comments back, but that's certainly my take. And yes, I know I'm not a female and I will never understand what it feels like. However, I'm basing it on what we see in the science and the research. And Very interesting. anecdotally, what I've experienced with many female athletes that I work with. Very interesting. Yeah, I feel like I've read a lot of very differing opinions on that for sure going through. And yeah, yeah I guess if the ultimately if the end is performance, you almost need to like put that piece kind of first and then you can kind of manipulate the other pieces around there. But the performance lens always has to stay on. Yeah, I mean, like health's a huge part. And obviously if someone feels terrible doing that, then yeah, like manipulate your training. But if, you're, if your priority is performance, then think about what the nutrition required is to make you perform at your absolute best. Yeah, that makes sense. Maybe, maybe I'm just being a bit simplistic, but that's certainly <laughs> what we're seeing. So um, um, so that that's sort of Sarah. So yeah, the, off on a tangent there, but a good one. Um, uh, yeah, with Sarah, that's what we saw. And we so we did try and manipulate it. And in the end, A, do you know what the reason we ended is? A, she didn't see any real performance benefits. And B, it was such a pain in the ass. Like, I think we've got enough stuff going on, let alone like, oh, Okay, now I'm switching over to a high fat, low carb. Like, what every two weeks, roughly, you've got to ch completely change your diet. Like, man, we got too much stuff going on. Like, I hear this notion of like manipulating your protein based around your cycle. It's like, I'm sorry, why? What What is the advantage of taking 1.6 grams versus say 2.2? There is no disadvantage in taking a higher protein intake. So why would you drop it down just based on your cycle? Like. It makes no sense. Yeah, the science might be interesting, but bring it back to practicalities. Be practical about this. Everyone, and I'll say this loudly, everyone who is an endurance athlete needs a higher protein intake. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to be crucified or taken, you know, someone can challenge that. But I'd like to see the evidence where taking on a lower amount of protein at any period of time during your training cycle whether you're male or female, young or old, is going to be advantageous. Okay, just keep it simple. Just keep eating a lot of protein. Yeah, and what does a lot of protein mean? Probably somewhere like two to three grams per kilo of body weight. And you could manipulate that based on maybe age. I wouldn't necessarily manipulate it based on gender. Mm -hmm. um, so just keep it simple. Like, don't We don't need to be so tricky. Yes, there's 
statistical significance and then there's clinical significance. And I think, again, that gets lost in the translation of science. You know, something that was statistically significant by 5.5% means F all in real terms, real world terms. So, Yeah, I think that was one of the coolest pieces is when I built LP Endurance was off of a local gym that we had here called Limitless Performance. So I feel like instantly we already had kind of that lens from like the strength building side of things of like get enough protein. So that was like driven into us early. And I felt like that was like one of the biggest game changers for like just being able to recover and come back day after day and be able to hit it and not get injured and still feel strong. Like, holy, that was a massive game changer. I know for Jess and I, for sure. Yeah, protein. It's funny, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, if you, I've seen some stuff about a carb illusion recently and <laughs> yeah. all this sort of stuff. And people talk about carbs all the time. And yes, there was a bit of talk about protein. And, you know, suddenly, you know, there's always macro of the month, isn't there? And that's how I term it. Like everyone's like, <laughs> oh, you got to eat protein. I oh, know you got to eat fat. You got to eat carbs. And it's like, look, end of the day, just eat a lot of protein. Um, and the forms of protein are obviously important and, and we could get into that as well. I mean, it's probably a whole episode in itself, but yeah. you know, regardless of your dietary preference, yes, if you're a plant-based athlete, you probably need to eat more of that protein, mm-hmm. um, just because of the amino acid profile and the quality of that protein and the way that it's assimilated by the body, but you can certainly do it. But if you're an omnivore, just eat good quality proteins as well, animal plant, um, and, and you'll be absolutely fine doesn't have to be complicated so yeah speaking of simplicity i know that was a, a key piece about how you built fuel and could you maybe for some of our listeners that aren't familiar with it kind of run us through how does it work and kind of some of the intent behind the way you built it what are you trying to get athletes to build is it habits or be able to count all their calories what does it look like from your end <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, we term it training-based nutrition. So in our opinion, like it's the world's first training-based nutrition app. So we sync directly with Training Peaks, TriDot, Final Surge, and Today's Plan. And actually, more recently, we launched a new feature for athletes that aren't even using a training platform where they can create their training calendar within Fuelin and then have that available to them and we'll build the nutrition around that. But first and foremost, it's about creating a personalized periodized nutrition program that is built on science and no bullshit that an athlete can follow very simply. So yes, we provide all the macros and all the caloric requirements on a daily basis and then split that into the individual macros and calories for every meal before, during or before and after each session. And then we also account for in-session fueling as well. The simplicity of the program, as we see it, is that we're trying to condition athletes to look at colors. So we use a traffic light system where red is a lower amount of carbohydrates, um, yellow is a moderate amount of carbohydrates, and green is a higher amount of carbohydrates. So from a meal perspective, when an athlete sees red, yeah, even if they're not tracking, and yes, we sync with My Fitness Pal, lose it. We're looking at chron- uh, chronometer or chronometer, however you want to say it. I think it's Canadian uh, macro tracking app, actually. Do you know chronometer? Yeah, I'm I'm aware of it. Never used it before, but I know of it. (laughs) It's pretty cool. It's actually a lovely interface. So we're looking at maybe integrating with that. And we're also bringing in an AI food tracker within Fuelin, which I actually think will probably eradicate the need for using any of these external apps unless you're really bound to them. But you'll just be able to talk into the phone, into the Fuelin app and say, you know, two poached eggs, half an avocado, a slice of toast and a, a flat white, which is pretty much a typical Aussie uh, breakfast that I had with a little bit of Vegemite uh, on the toast. And uh, <laughs> well, and that will track, of course, Vegemite. And that will track all your macros within Fuelin and log that directly with the meal that it's associated with, which I, I think for most athletes is just going to be incredible. And that's yeah, where I think so things cool. like AI is pretty cool. Um, so they, they will see these colors. So if you see red as an athlete, once you get used to it, you're like, okay, well, I know that's not high amounts of carbs. It's just lots of veggies. So they're, they're then, we're, and we're conditioning athletes to really focus. You talk about habits, you know, somewhere between five and nine serves of veggies every day, fruit and vegetables every day. Ideally, you know, two serves of fruit per day and somewhere between, you know, five and seven serves of vegetables and really conditioning athletes to say, you know what, this is, this is also about my health. We know athletes that eat 
higher amounts of fruit and vegetables. If you look at all those non-communicable type diseases, you know, we talk about diabetes, there's an epidemic worldwide, US, Canada, um, certainly in Australia, there's metabolic issues, uh, metabolic disease, type two diabetes, look at all cause cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, whatnot. Those individuals who eat more fruit and veg have a lower risk of, um, you know, suffering from those types of diseases. Talk about sleep, everyone's tracking sleep. Um, you know, everyone's looking for the magic pill to do it. And it's like right there in front of you, eat more fruit and veg. Yeah. It's going to be better for you. It's going to fill you up. It's going to create satiation. You get your fiber intake again, go back to the gut. That's great for the gut. Um, lower caloric den density in those foods, despite eating huge volumes, total calories are probably going to be lower. So if you are trying to improve body composition, if you are trying to lose weight, fruit and veg are your answer. And, you know, anyone who tries to say that fruit will make you fat, I'm like, come on. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I've talked about that previously where it's like, yeah, there is so many bigger fish to fry than talking about bananas and oranges and things like that. So, you know, I think, again, from a high level perspective, what we are conditioning the athletes to do is really put more fruit and veg on their plate. And I think that's a... That's you know something I'm incredibly passionate about, and I think the reports from athletes where they're like, "Wow, I've never eaten so many vegetables or salad in my life," and man, I feel good. And even from yes, performance, even like from a physical performance improves, but from a mental perspective, they're like, "I've never felt so clear." Huh. Yeah, you know, my mental acuity, my concentration's better, my sleep is better, and that all plays into one, doesn't it? Because you know you start having better, well, better nutrition improves sleep, better sleep improves nutrition. Mm -hmm. And so it, it all, yeah, again, don't let's stop looking at nutrition and every other fo feature of health and performance as silos. They all play into each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nutrition helps sleep. Sleep helps nutrition. Nutrition helps your health. Your health will help nutrition. Nutrition will help training. Training will help performance. You know, nutrition within that training and performance aspect all plays into it where we talk about higher carbs and so it's it's like it's so integral nutrition in the mm -hmm. scheme of it all like it, it just cannot be separated from health or performance uh certainly from my view and i'm probably maybe a little biased because it is my industry but i think when you talk to really high level athletes and high level coaches they they certainly see that um connection it's very yeah. clear to them yeah, that's one of the biggest pieces when people join our club is we show like the pillars of performance, those pieces you're talking about around nutrition, recovery, the training itself in this like actual cycle that all works together versus like everybody comes in, they're like, I just need to do the training to get to my race. And it's like, all of these need to be seen as equally important. And some of these aspects outside of training might even need to be more important than your training because none of the training is going to matter if you don't get any sleep and you're eating like crap or under fueled. Like it's, it's wild. Correct. It's actually funny. You say you did that wheel because actually in the last, we, we do a lot of Q and A's for the members on fuel in, and then we put them on YouTube afterwards. And I think the one I did on Q4 preparation, I actually go through an infographic about the interconnection between sleep and every other parameter you just mentioned. So um, for your listeners or your athletes, it might be a good uh, YouTube to introduce them to, and they can have a look at that episode. Sweet. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll grab that link for me and I can throw it in the show notes if anybody wants to check that out. Um, and we were just talking about the colors. <laughs> we keep going off tangents. So um, yeah, red is that. And so if then an athlete says yellow, okay, you've got your base, your base carbohydrates coming from leafy greens and some fruits. And then you're probably just going to layer on top of that. You need some more carbs. So that might be a slice of toast. It might be a small handful of, you know, cooked grains or rice, um, whatever you want to layer onto that. And so you're just layering on the meal without having to create a new meal, you're just bumping the carb intake. And then same for green. Obviously, if you've got a, a big race or you've got a really hard session, we're going to tell the athlete to minimize fiber in that meal. They'll actually get that recommendation within the session cell, uh, the meal cell. But if not, you've got time. You're layering again, lots of fruit and veg. Uh, yeah, lots of, or certainly veg in that meal, maybe a piece of fruit. And then you're just layering on instead of one piece of toast, it might be two bits instead of one cupped hand of, um, you know, couscous or, you know, whatever whole grain you're putting in there, 
you're, you're adding two or three. If it's pasta, if it's rice, you're just layering it on. So your total carb amount goes from 30 grams as an average to 50 grams as an average to green being 100 grams. And so the athlete just starts to recognize those colors and then has in their head what their favorite red meals are, or red snacks or their yellow meals, yellow snacks or green meals and green snacks. And it takes a little bit of getting used to. And I think I'll always say it, like if nutrition was easy, everyone would be smashing it. And clearly the way the world is, that is not the case. So it does take a bit of effort. Uh, I think effort is required, unfortunately, uh, for everything in life. And I think, again, it's probably a reflection of where we are as a, a species that everything should just be super simple. And unfortunately, that's not the case. Like people who are fit and healthy work hard at it. And you you can't just wish yourself healthy. Like you can't wish yourself to be a great bike, you know, a cyclist or a swimmer or a runner. You probably started pretty poorly at whatever you started. And then you got better because you worked hard at it. You trained it. And lo and behold, you, you improve. And it's exactly the same with nutrition. Like not everyone's Jamie Oliver at the start. And I'm not <laughs> expecting anyone to be Jamie Oliver or Gordon Ramsay, but yeah, you, you got to start somewhere. Start with simple meals. You know, it might be cooking chicken on the grill. Yeah, a steak on the grill. Like I use a gas barbecue all the time because there's no cleanup. Like it's great. You don't have any pans to clean up. So just grilled chicken. Like last night's meal was literally, we were like looking in the freezer and I was like, I wasn't organized. I was like, okay, I've got frozen chicken breasts. I've got some burger patties. Okay, we can grill those. We had broccolini, grilled that as well. Some zucchini, grilled that as well. And then Mel, my partner, we had like, for some reason, we had 13 cucumbers and some red peppers in the in the fridge. I was like, try and make a salad. And, you know, we just did a cucumber with sesame seed and a little bit of goat's cheese salad. Took literally 10 minutes to prep the whole thing. We sat down and had a lovely family meal. And it was, I guess it's about like, it was super simple but we have the environment set up to succeed. And I think that's another big point we talk about a lot. We feel in is like, yeah, have, have an environment where it will facilitate what you're trying to achieve. If you don't have the food in your freezer or your fridge or your pantry, you're definitely not going to succeed because you're just going to reach for the phone and order Uber Eats. And that, you know, quickly derails the whole plan. Whereas if you've got, the basics you can always make something that will fit the system of fuel in because again we don't tell you specifically oh you need to eat you know chicken with asparagus and this on wednesday night and when you suddenly don't have that in the fridge you freak out and you're like oh i can't do this it's too hard it's just principles it's systems you look and you go okay i need 30 grams of protein i need this much fat and it's got the carbs written as macros you look at the carb color okay it's yellow. Great. We're having broccolini. We're going to have some eggplant and we're going to make some, you know, whole, I don't know, some sort of whole grain or brown rice with it to accompany the chicken that we're going to grill because that's going to be the main source of protein. And so you can just, you can pick and mix whatever you want based on the principles. And for me and the team at Fuel that is a sustainable nutrition approach. It's not a diet. It's just nutrition. And it's nutrition that will support whatever you're trying to achieve. So is uh so does the app actually t so it's looking at your training kind of ahead to essentially plan out what you need to be kind of hitting to make sure that you're prepared for that? Is it looking at both time and intensity to to do this? Is it like taking it off like a training stress score essentially, or like how does that work? I know I have a bunch of nerdy guys who uh, listen to this yeah, podcast, yeah. so they, they want details. <laughs> no, so it, like you as the coach, Mark, you would you would input the intensity of the session. So we pick that up. We pick it up a number of ways. The easiest is by putting in a Z score in the title um, of it. So like, I don't know, do you call your sessions anything? Some coaches call their sessions really funny things. Like they might be like, you know, the slow burn or, you know, things like that like I'm literally i just yeah <laughs> yeah literally we just need like either a z and then a two or a z and a three to distinguish okay. between zone two and zone three so that's the first thing we do look at intensity factor 
So if intensity factor in a structured workout is built in, we will look at that and we'll use that to build out the intensity. And then duration obviously is a huge part because even if it's a zone three, and again, look, we could do, we could distinguish between zone one, two, three, four, five. The reality is, is the way we, we simplify it for athletes who have to determine their own zones. Zone two and zone one, we regard as lower carb fueling. Um, zone three and above is going to be higher carb fueling. So the distinction as a coach or an athlete, when they're inputting that into their training program in the session title is just, we need to know zone two or zone three, really simple. Um, you know, yes, we appreciate it maybe four or five, but we don't need to know that from our perspective because it's just going to be higher carb fueling. Now that higher carb fueling may not be applied if the session duration is not of significance. So we're not saying to you, okay, it's a zone three, 30 minute session. You need to suck down 90 grams of carbs. Like that's just stupid. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, when you look at some of the information out there, and this is where it gets very confusing, I think for athletes is like, oh, I've got to eat carbs. I've got to eat carbs all the time. It's like, no, it's not that simple. Like there is intensity. Yes, it, first and foremost, but then there is duration. Duration is a huge part, like 60 minute run, even a 70 minute run. I'm not saying you have to eat something during that. Yeah. Like, come on, especially if your purpose is to improve body composition. Mm -hmm. Like now it's a calorie game and yes, calories matter. Everyone like it's physics. <laughs> you have to be in a caloric deficit in order to reduce body fat and reduce weight, managing that deficit. So it's not so big to push you into low energy availability that's certainly something that we take very seriously. Very cool. Um, I want to use a couple case studies because there's a few uh, female pros who've been crushing it. Rachel Zelinskis, who we had on the podcast uh, right after she won Montremblant, coming off of like some serious injuries the last couple of years, and Sky Monch, who just went, I think it was 822 in Florida a couple of weeks after Kona. Like both of them, I know, have worked, have used fuel in. Maybe you can talk a little bit about kind of the impact uh, fuel in's had for them. Yeah, I mean, both both those athletes, they're such, I, I think I could say lovely women, but lovely yeah. human beings, um, just top people. And it, it's really interesting. I'm in this point in with Fuelin where, and males might hate me for saying this, uh, is that the women athletes are so much more open to learning at this point in time. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> Like, and, and kudos to the women athletes out there who actually is like, you know what? I don't know fucking everything. So why don't you, as the expert, help me learn a little bit more about myself rather than, unfortunately, I've had so, I've had male athletes who just literally tell me what they do. And then I'm like, cool. Like, do you want me to help you or not? <laughs> and I can tell you now there is one male pro who I can't necessarily talk about at this point but one of the best athletes in the world. And he is probably one of the best athletes in the world because he actually was open to learning, even though he'd been in the game for so bloody long. And that for me summed up him as a person because it was like, oh, okay, well, that's probably why you are, you know, that good. Whereas like I find at the moment, there just seems to be this like, oh, I know what I'm doing and I'm fine. And that's cool. Like if men want to do that, that's fine. But I just think there is that opportunity to be better. And what we're seeing with the female athletes, certainly with Rachel and, and you know, certainly with Sky. I mean, we'll talk about Sky, what she did. Um, but like there's that thirst for knowledge and that openness to learn, which I think is really maybe that is why women's sport is accelerating at the rate at which it is because mm -hmm. they're now open to learning well they're not they've always been open to learning sorry i should clarify that i think they're getting given the opportunity now to have the resources to help them excel and i think that is super exciting and we should all be trying to push that along um in the case of rachel and yeah i mean so what I love about Rach is like she's built this team around her and she's like you know what i don't want to work in a silo and I think that's, again, what we talked about when we're in Kona is like everything I've done in a professional sporting environment has been about like eradicating silos. So you don't want the nutrition to be here and the coach doing the training here. You try and work as a team. So she's works with Andrew Yoda. 
uh, like I had a call the other day, I was driving up to Queensland, you know, long drive and we had this team call and it's so cool because she's got Clive Brewer, who is strength and conditioning coach. He was, was, was he at the Blue Jays? He might've been Blue Jays as well or something like that. And, uh, you know, he works just in, um, his own facility now working with high level athletes. You've got Andrew Yoda, you got myself, and then you got Rachel who's facilitating this. And she recognized that she had serious injuries and serious issues. And a lot of those issues stem from disordered eating and an eating disorder where she talks pretty openly about that and what she went through, through her, um, her youth and through her early twenties. I mean, she was still the second youngest uh, female at Kona this year. Uh, on that start at line for the professionals and she's had some really tough times and still has tough times, I think in terms of injuries and things like that. And that is, and I'm thankful for her to talk about that because that is a direct reflection of what ha- the impact or the negative impact that nutrition done badly can have. Uh, and it's not short term, like those negative effects are going to stay with Rachel for quite some time. And may it last, you know, maybe forever. We don't know that yet. So I'll give you an example. Her, her bone mineral density was, you know, osteoporotic, wow. uh, spinal, ulna, left hip. Uh, and that's what you typically measure with that. And, yeah, we, we've, we're we doing repeat bone mineral density scans and it's awesome to see there has been improvement uh, because she's fueling properly. She's doing adequate loading but there's still a long way to go. And so it is a balancing act with her. Like, you know, where do we focus? And that's what the whole team approach is about. Like, where do we put the priorities in terms of strength training, nutrition, like looking at, I mean, she takes in a huge amount of calories, but her caloric expenditure is also huge. Mm -hmm. And I think, and that's where we're trying to get that balance between, you know, getting enough calories into it and make that physically possible as well. So, you know, now it's coming down to drinking calories in, you know, a bit more concentrated form just to get them in, uh, which is often a mistake. A lot of athletes who maybe face the other side of it where they have issues with body composition or weight and they think drinking smoothies and stuff like that is healthy, but actually it's just intake of huge amounts of calories that probably provides very little satiation. So mm. with, Rate it becomes very important because we're trying to get extra calories in to ensure there's not a caloric deficit versus others where it's like, hey, we might need to remove these. So yeah, look, Rach, I think you know, you talked about Mount Tremblant, like it was so cool to see her, you know, come back and win that race. Uh her intake of race fuel, so carbs on the bike, on the run, it will continue to improve. Uh she ran at Florida, she actually ran her fastest marathon. I think it was three or five. Um, pretty cool to see a couple of weeks coming off Kona where unfortunately, and she didn't ever talk about this. And this is probably a measure of her character. She was so sick in Kona and, you know, she still was able to be in that lead pack behind Lucy and still did, you know, really well mm-hmm. um, yeah, overall um, and extremely proud of her efforts. Yeah. With that. And I think it was just, it was, we'll notch it down as a learning experience. Uh, that whole this whole year, I think, and I think next year will be pretty special for her if we can keep her injury free and uh, avoid, you know, any issues certainly with bones. Yeah, she really feels like a a future star in coming if she can keep things rolling. I see that yeah. trajectory for her for sure. Yeah, I think so. I think, and and she's so lovely and quite an, very analytical. I think because of her background. Uh, so yeah, no, very cool. And uh, let's talk about the uh, new female fastest U.S. Ironman in history that just happened the other week, which is Sky, who was eight twenty-two. What a! And tell us a little bit about how you've worked with Sky. Yeah, so weirdly enough, I reached out to Sky um, quite a long time before we started working together in May, and. I, for whatever reason, she did apologize. She was like, oh, "I feel really bad. I literally." blanked you or ghosted you on Instagram. And I was like, that's cool. So we started working together in March, uh, sorry, May uh, of this year. And it was just a slow build, but we just wanted to see where things went. And she was really, I think her focus and what's really cool about Sky is like her focus is she wanted to be healthy and she had no interest in losing weight um, despite 
and she will she's talking about this a little bit more and there was an article in triathlete magazine online uh, talking about this where she's had some previous issues with past coaches where you know i think it was two or three weeks before kona the previous year she was told that she might have to lose five kilos uh, oh in order to be competitive yeah uh, not the best thing to say to an athlete um before a world championship but uh anyway um so she our focus was on health as a priority you know she's never had any issues from a, a cycle perspective and she never wants to have that she's never had any bone injuries she's a fairly robust athlete and she wants to continue that and i think that's such a really cool it's such a different spin on it all because i think so often we hear athletes like oh i've been injured in the past i want to you know recover from that or i want to get my weight down to be at this race weight and we were like look let's just focus on health smashing your training sessions and see where you can go so she's under david tilbury um a coach and so we had connections there like met david and whatnot and then it was just a process with sky uh, i have a weekly call with her every week she never rarely misses it um just to talk through you know the ins and outs of nutrition not always science-based you know we were talking about kimchi the other day because she's obviously uh, that was after florida uh, and just like she, she asks interesting questions about, you know, random things about nutrition, but obviously in that period building up to Kona, um, we were targeting top five and we knew, well, we had in our, we had a belief within the team that she could finish top five, even though her name was not even mentioned anywhere in the top 10. So I think what was really cool, like we had, because she'd been practicing and training her nutrition so frequently, and we were up to, you know, high intakes of carbs with her recovering extremely well and performing really well on the bike and really focusing on that run off the bike. We were in a very confident position going into Kona. And the reason we were so confident is because Frankfurt, uh, was it Frankfurt? Yeah, Frankfurt, where she came second, she effectively gave herself hyponatremia. Um, because she has an extremely low sweat rate and, but she has this habit of, as she says, like, I'll just go past an aid station. I'm like, oh, it's giving away water. I'm just going to drink some water. And I'm like, oh my God. So she didn't follow the plan in that. And she like owned it. She was like, yeah, I didn't really follow the plan. And that created, you know, it's, it's like she literally lost sort of control of her legs in that and, you know, had signs and symptoms of hyponatremia. So a really valuable experience, even though not something any athlete wants to experience in itself. But, you know, she came second in that race as a result. And so it was like, okay, what do we learn from that? And then what can we take into Kona? So, yeah, Kona, I think was really positive. You know, did she have the best race of her life? No, she, she'll talk about that and maybe we can get her on with you. <laughs> um, <love> yeah, <laughs> she didn't have, she didn't have the best swim. Um, it wasn't terrible, but then she rode her bike as she did and she ran a really good run. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, disappointing to be caught at the very end um, by Chelsea, but, you know, I think seventh in a world champs uh, is, is very respectable, uh, respectable. So mm -hmm. That was great. And then obviously, you know, she said, well, a few weeks later, I'm going to be doing Ironman Florida. And I was like, is this a good thing? And she goes, to be honest, historically, she's always backed up really well um, after big races. So David, like we kept talking about this, like she hadn't produced the run that she needed to produce or was capable of producing after coming off the bike. So we purposely tweaked a few things. So her carb load, the amounts we'd practice that a couple of times taking in a, a fairly significant amount more in the build up to the race and that worked that seemed to sit really well with her so we pushed that higher uh the day before florida and then we increased her carb intake as well on the morning of so her breakfast but then increased some of the amounts that she was taking at specific times so we doubled the amount she took 60 minutes before the uh, swim and she also doubled the amount so we used instead of and it makes sense like you're about to go and swim you know for 50 minutes and athletes are having like 25 grams in one gel we were like well why don't we just use the morton 160 and give you 40 grams instead yeah. so whether you use that product or whether you just suck back on two gels at once like take on at least 50 or 60 grams before you jump in the water. So 
yeah and those we practiced those in training and that had a positive impact and then obviously you know she we bumped up the carb intake on the bike a little bit more because again i think the thing that most athletes need to recognize is whatever you have in your bottles or your bento and that it doesn't all go in like some of it sits in the bottle at the bottom like you look at the bottom of the bottle afterwards and there's this like layer of goop that's carbs like so it's not all going in so we overestimated over budgeted and then she took in that so yes we put on instagram what she took in it's a best guess um based on what we think and that's based on what she we when we had a you know review on what she got through she did miss some stuff um so it did actually drop the amount down and then obviously the runoff the bike was fantastic and she finally i think it was what did she say two or three years after she ran a sub three she she ran this and uh felt like a bull uh, 254 you know, what a marathon 254 so she thinks she can go sub 250 yeah she thinks she can go 250 i don't think any female has run a 250 i might be incorrect annie hogg in uh in Kona, oh, yeah, 248 course record sorry. baby <laughs> sorry there we go but it's rare maybe it's rare, maybe but... it's a no u.s woman has ever run sub 250 i think I that heard. sounds that that sounds right yeah so i think it's possible um i think now it's all about you know tweaking so i think what's really important for people to recognize and hear from this as well like we started working in may together like it wasn't like this happened overnight like there were failures or fails, I guess, if you consider coming second at Frankfurt a fail. Um, but yeah, there were some interesting experiences in training, GI issues, things like that. Like that happens, but that's all part of that process. And so I think like, and Sky will 100% say this, is like it, it's been a process, a learning experience for me as her coach from a nutrition perspective and her as an athlete you know, working with the program and it's, it's really cool. Like to talk to her about that experience and yeah, we asked her to describe fuel in, in three words. And one of the words was happy. And <laughs> I thought it was such a, I'd never like, no one had ever really mentioned happy. Like, you know, and I was like, Oh, that's an interesting like emotion to say. And she's like, but it's so true. It just makes me happy. It makes my husband happy. <laughs> um, when he's happy, I'm even happier. And then everyone's happy. And she's like, you know, I, I look at my food now and I'm happy. And she, she's got back into cooking more and Rachel's got back into cooking. And even Rachel said this as a quote, like, she was like, I used to use baking as like her coping mechanism mm. because it was like, oh, if I cook for people that will keep them at bay and that makes them happy. But Rachel's actually cooking for herself now. Nice. And she's baking for herself because she actually can eat all those cookies and cakes and things that were she was making. And same for for Sky, she's like getting into, you know, that love of cooking has sort of really come back. And Sarah Pian Piano said the same thing. It's like I now recognize that food is not something that's an enemy. It's actually it's probably the thing that's going to make one of the biggest, if not the biggest, difference to how. I can consistently perform on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think when you can, again, change mindset around food and it's not always like restriction, it's like, you know, we, we have this like little internal and maybe we should probably trademark it, like let license to fuel. And it's like, you know, your in-session fueling, we keep separate from day-to-day -day fueling. So we do that on purpose so that athletes when they've got a session that is appropriate with the appropriate intensity, it's like, just go for it. Don't feel bad about 60 grams an hour, 90 grams an hour, 120, whatever it is you require based on your testing, like just fuel it and feel awesome hmm. and do have that nutrition on board because your coach is going to love it because you're hitting the numbers that the coach wants you to hit. And then you're going to recover better. And then tomorrow you're going to wake up and go like, oh, I feel pretty good. I can do the session again. And so I think that license to fuel sort of moniker is like, is quite cool where, you know, they just don't have that, that guilt around eating in session. Love that. Oh man, that's so good. Um, so jumping a little bit to that carb loading you talked about, maybe you could even use like me as an example for like tuning up for an Ironman. So I'm like, uh, 
I think I'm somewhere around like 72 kilos or something like that, like 157 pounds, somewhere around there. I work, uh, I work in kilos. <laughs> yeah, I'm, perfect. I'm, I'm a metric. Sure which I'm metric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's only, there's only a couple of countries that work <laughs> imperial still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very so confusing it's... for everyone because this is the, the funniest thing about it is like everyone talks about grams of macros. Yeah. Yeah. But then everything else is in like imperial. And I'm like, yeah. oh, can't we just like nutrition? Even the back of labels generally is in grams now. Yeah. Like, Come on. We got to move with this. I think there yes. should be a push. We just change yeah. all labeling. It needs to, to be universal somewhere. Else is so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So let's carb loading kilos, for someone like me. What, what 70 kilos. Yeah. Somewhere around there. Close enough. Yeah. Yeah. So look, at a minimum, we talked about this on socials as well. And I think we've got some really nice infographics for people to look at on our social media, uh, on Instagram, but yeah, at a minimum, at least eight grams per kilo of body weight in that 24 hour period beforehand. Um, again, depending on, this is where I think the specificity of it all, like, you know, what I said with athletes like Rachel, um, like sky and certainly what I see with some very good age groupers and those with big power numbers and fast running ability, then yeah, I mean, it makes sense that you might require more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with them, we were pushing them up. Yeah. To be honest, it was like 11, 11, 12 grams per kilo body weight in that day before. Now you also have to factor in their smaller athletes, the total volume of food, isn't quite as much as like say you and me, like you're 70 kilos. I'm 82. Like me eating 12 grams per kilo body weight. It's a lot of carbs. <laughs> and anyone who's done, like we get this feedback a lot as well. Like athletes are like, Oh yeah, I've done carb loads. And you're like, did you have a pasta meal the night before the race? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I loaded. It's like, that's part of a load. That is like a very small. And then when they do a proper carb load, they're like, Holy shit. Like, Okay, now I get like, and that's why you need to practice your carb load because you need to work out what products you can take on board in order to actually not feel like a sloth mm -hmm. and feel pretty good and not like as if you're about to explode. So low fiber, obviously things like your fruit and veg goes, well, fruit you can keep in, but certainly veg goes out the door. You know, you talk about white products. This is where ultra processed and processed foods do oh, yeah. start to serve a purpose. So Again, don't talk about good and bad foods. Talk about purposeful foods. Pop so your white baby, one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, I don't go down the pop tart route. I talk about rice bubbles a lot. I think you call them yeah. rice krispies. So yeah. rice rice krispies or rice bubbles and maple syrup is like a go to. Uh, boiled white rice with maple syrup, a little bit of yogurt, and some blueberries. That's also another go to for me. And a lot of athletes use that. Um, just maltodextrin in a liter you know you can put 100 grams of maltodextrin Mal the cool thing about maltodextrin have you ever had maltodextrin yeah i have yeah so it's zero flavor yeah like there's no sweetness in maltodextrin whatsoever which is probably why it's dangerous mm -hmm. um but you could took take in 100 grams of just you know buy maltodextrin from yeah depending on type of athlete and obviously banned substances and all that but it's a food grade product so if you buy it from a food store it's no different from buying gatorade or anything like that buy a bag of maltodextrin, put in a hundred grams of that into a liter of water and drink that over two hours. You're not going to get any GI issues because it's effectively 50 grams an hour. You're under that. You could probably put 120 grams in there, to be honest, and drink that over the course of two hours. You're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really nice way of getting a huge amount of carbohydrates in without necessarily uh, increasing that feeling of fullness. And then it's just repetition as well. You don't need to eat a different meal at every, every, you don't need to eat a different recipe at every meal. Talk to, you listen to Holly, Holly Lawrence talk. And I remember when I saw her carb load for the first time and I was like, you literally ate the same thing for breakfast, lunch, dinner. And she's like, yeah, I love it. <laughs> and I was like, that's cool, but it works. Like, yeah. yeah. And again, like you don't have to be Gordon Ramsay on carb load day. If you want to eat white rice, if you want to eat white bread, yeah, I eat raisin toast. I don't know. I love raisin toast. Like that stuff's like just milk and honey sort of stuff. Like it's so delicious. And um, yeah, whatever it is you you can tolerate, you get your numbers in and you feel good on, that's what I would be going for. And yeah, I think it's pra it's practice that. Yeah, it's all those secret little like carb adders that are so important that I finally figured out this year and I was 
like you said, aiming, I think I was up doing about 11 grams per kilogram of body weight. And wow, good. what a massive difference it made in racing. Like just felt yeah. so strong all day and sustainable. And like, yeah, you just didn't feel the same pressure. Like sure. You still took in the carbs during, but it just felt like you, yeah, you, there was such less of an onus. If you missed a gel here or there that you were so torched because of it. <laughs> Yeah. And, and certainly look, when you get up over 10 grams and you're in that 10, 11, 12, like that's not for someone to take on lightly. And I think also look at your ability. Um, there are differences like higher level athletes have the, again, the research isn't conclusive, but higher caliber athletes actually have the ability to store more glycogen as well. Mm -hmm. So that is an important aspect to consider when you are loading. And that's why we probably say, okay, start with eight grams because that's probably the minimum amount to have a positive impact and then increase it incrementally from there based on your experience. And I think that's going to serve male, female, young or old, at least as a starting point, again, keeping it simple, let's have a, a principle based, based approach and then go from there based on your ability as an athlete. Um, what's really important then just talking about females and the difference here is that again, the phase of the menstrual cycle can impact your ability to store carbohydrates. However, if you do overcome that threshold, say around eight grams per kilo body weight, then regardless if you're in the follicular phase where carbohydrate storage is not as optimized as say in that later phase, you can still store adequate amounts of glycogen. And so this is why you go on a grams per kilo basis as opposed to a percentage of total calories. Because if your total calories is too low, then the grams per kilo of carbohydrates is obviously going to be too low as well. So it's much better working off a grams per kilo body weight rather than a percentage of calories when you're at least applying that to a carb load. I would argue all the time, but... Um, yeah, I think percentages of calories is a really backwards way now of looking at yeah. prescribing a, a nutrition intake. Like you're going to, if you're taking in 1400 calories and you're only taking 20% of protein, your protein numbers are going to be pretty low. So mm -hmm. I would say build out your protein first, build out your fat, and then remainder is your carbs. And then you adjust those carb amounts based on the training volume and doing it that way. Very cool. All right, last topic for today because I'm sure we'll uh, we'll have to split this into a couple of podcasts uh, in the future. I don't want to leak out all the uh, all the topics in this one, but last one, a little bit about kind of race weight slash weight management. Um, how do you kind of approach that with athletes? Like, um, yeah, I guess there's kind of two maybe phases in the time of year, like a foundation season right now where people are kind of resetting, and I know a lot of people are maybe focused on this being a time to make some body comp changes. And then also as you get close to a race with race weight, if, uh, if that's something you're a fan of, what's kind of your take on all of that? Yeah, it's funny. We actually just put a post out on Instagram on race weight. I don't know mm -hmm. if that's where this has come from, but yeah, look, race weight is not all year round. I think it, that's first and foremost. I think you, you should be fluctuating that. And I think that gives you opportunity to be more relaxed at certain periods of time and then dial things in as you go. I think Q4, and again, this is a really interesting thing because I think Q4, and I'm, I've been pretty vocal about this as well. Like, I'm so sick of athletes saying, Oh, I've got no more races, therefore I don't need nutrition. It's like, pretty sure, like, Q4 is like the opportunity for you to really dial it in and hit where you want to be. So, again, I'm not saying if you're already in a pretty good shape, you don't need to necessarily get into full race shape in Q4. But for those athletes who, potentially have struggled throughout the year and maybe finally got to where they want to be. Don't let Q4 undo all that good work. Like this is your opportunity to potentially double down, smash it out of the park so that you come into 2024 in good shape and then getting to race weight is actually easy because losing weight during season is tough because then you've got to apply a caloric deficit to it suddenly training with training volume going up, you get tired, potentially injuries start to occur because you're actually under fueling yourself and so on. So I would argue you're better off really hitting Q4 hard and really focus on like, what is your, what is your purpose? What is your focus? What are your priorities? If it is improving body composition, losing some weight to get into a healthy weight 
And I'm not saying like at your super race weight, but mm -hmm. you know, maybe you've had a DEXA scan, maybe your fat mass index puts you into a, you know, at risk or at least, you know, requires a tension type position. Your, your lean mass index is again, suboptimal for your age and your gender based on population. Um, yes, percentage of body fat, everyone's going to look at, but ultimately, you know, yes, you can look at it, but it's not the most important number. What does your bone mineral density look like? Then do something about that and say, okay, wow, I am carrying a bit too much fat. And again, controversial topic for why I don't know, but apparently talking about people being fat is really tough these days. It's like, no, there is actually an obesity epidemic and yes, I know we're triathletes and all this sort of stuff, but it still exists. Like, you know, you've only got to go to a race and there's certainly athletes that you would not consider in a healthy weight range. Mm -hmm. Now there is an opportunity there to improve your health. First and foremost, forget race performance yes it will be impacted if your race if your body composition improves and you get rid of some unnecessary fat mass but from a health perspective i think first and foremost target q4 to improve your health maybe it's yeah get the dexa i mentioned maybe you get um some baseline bloods so look at your lipid profile look at your hba1c your glucose um yeah what other markers you could look at some you know, uh omega-3 index you know some basic markers around that just from a and then obviously iron status if you are an endurance athlete i would look at that vitamin d you could look at that as well coming into winter where do you sit okay this is my picture i'm a little bit overweight or i'm very overweight I've got poor vitamin D. I'm about to go into deep, dark winter in the Northern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. My omega-3 index is terrible. And I know that's related to heart disease, neurodegenerative disease, um, you know, and metabolic type syndromes. My iron panel is pretty poor. I wonder why I'm always like lethargic. And so, okay, I'm going to get my health in order by improving body composition by improving my nutritional intake to support those deficiencies, plus or minus adding in on top of that, maybe some supplementation to complement my diet. And then eight to 12 weeks later, retesting. Yeah, whether it's repeat some bloods on those certain things where you're deficient or insufficient, retesting, getting a DEXA, retesting performance metrics, maybe with yourself, like maybe it is FTP testing at every four or every six weeks in that 12 week block and going, Oh wow, I made some significant improvement. You come into 2024 season, you're like, this is going to be a great year. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, it's just such a different mindset to approach it. Like Q4 does not mean like, Hey, nope. let's just go and <laughs> you know, hit the cause light. Uh, yeah. That's why so. we, we've reframed it as instead of off season, it's foundation season because we literally, I truly believe it's what it is the most important season to set people up for a successful year. Like you just put yourself on the back foot and play catch up. And there's so much more pressure on you to like nail everything so perfectly when you don't take care of those things in foundation season. <laughs> Honestly, like, and, and the best thing is like, and I say this with like fuel, speaking from a fuel in perspective. So when you're obviously, if you're right, if your goal weight is less than your current weight, Obviously, we're applying a caloric deficit to that, to your total nutrition. But like, and and we often say, and I w actually want to put in a, a a way in which you can't have more than say a four or five pound uh, weight difference. So you, like, you can only put in five pounds below. And so when you get to that, what you see is this switch in caloric intake, and suddenly it might go from all red, and then the athlete's like, "Holy shit!" And now I'm getting yellow and green meals. And they're like, this is so cool. I'm like eating so much more and like smashing my carbs and my training feels great. It's like, wouldn't it be better to be in that position all the time in the race so that you're actually, you're looking forward to eating. You don't feel guilty about having a couple of bits of toast in the morning before your, you know, your 70 minute threshold trainer session. You're like, wow, I ate during that. And either you're eating during that session, depending on the duration and you're certainly eating a hell of a lot afterwards to refuel and recover rather than thinking, Oh God, 
you know, I, I get it. I've got to be in a caloric deficit. That makes sense. Okay, I've got to be watching what I'm eating and really focus on that. It's just such a nicer way to approach, you know, Q4 is, you, what do you call it? Foundation. Foundation. Like build, build your foundation, build your habits. Like all that stuff we talked about at the start of this episode, build those habits in vegetables, fruits, good quality protein, sleep, you know, appropriate supplementation, whatever. Um, and then you, then you have a great season. 100%. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's super cool. I, I, it's, it's really, yeah, I hear coaches like yourself, like Maddie Dixon, like they, they're talking about same similar principles in this. Like, yeah, it's not, it's not off season. It's maybe you can call it post season, but I think call it foundation season. Like, you know, it, it's, it's an foundation opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm sure you get feedback from athletes when they, well, you will get feedback once they complete it all that like, they're like, wow, that was cool. And if, I'm sure if you do collect some data on how the race season goes and compare that to previous years, whether it be things like run performance, spike, swim performance, FTP numbers, whatever, like even results, like I'm sure you're going to get significant difference and even track injuries. Mm -hmm. I think tracking injuries would be fascinating because you know, are you building that resilience through, I'm sure, a lot of strength training mm -hmm. in this foundation period? Uh, and then, yeah, I think I think you're going to have great results as a result. Yeah. That's Just a, as long as their nutrition's <laughs> on point. That's the main Yeah, thing. exactly. <laughs> yeah, but that's such a huge point in this season is like you have so many less demands on probably the volume you're doing and the intensity. Like, use that like fire that you have and put it into some other areas. And that is usually strength training and new and foundational nutritional habits that are like, once you get those two down, then you can kind of like get the good habits down and set them, forget them for when your training ramps up to 20 hours a week or you're in doing threshold sessions I, and VO twos. like, Oh man. <laughs> I saw, um, was it Sam Long posted something about like a 30 hour training week the other day? Did you say that? I, I think I he like, posted his like peak ever week. I think it was like 42 hours. That was wild. Like, from was like COVID time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then he was talking about, is it realistic to have 30 hours? And yeah, we see, I see a lot like, you know, the, the pros, they, they will train, you know, that 24 to mm -hmm. 28 hours, but probably not very often over 30. So yeah. I would subscribe to what he's saying. And I think it's, um, yeah, it's it's tough. like I mean, God, I do like thirteen or fourteen hours, and I'm like dying. <laughs> this is, like, how do people do this? But then the the irony with this. Sorry, I know we should probably wrap this up soon, but the irony with this is like I think when you look at the recommendations for like exercise on a daily basis, it's around what sixty minutes a day. So that's seven hours a week. And so, like, I can guarantee you, none of my friends do seven hours of training no, a week. Not like, even close. <laughs> not many athletes, do, to be honest, age yeah. groupers. But if you actually break it down, you're like, actually, the minimum I should be doing is seven. And then if I want to be better than the rest, okay, I probably need to get into the 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 hours to really, you know, accelerate the performance element. So, yeah, I think it, that's also like when you break things down into chunks. And you say, oh, it's 60 minutes a day. That's seven hours of training a week. That's manageable. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't not be manageable seven hours a week. Agreed. Uh, so what are... Yeah, uh... That's that's coming from a father mm -hmm. of two under two as well. Yeah. So don't I don't want any excuses from people going, oh, you don't have kids or anything. I'm like, yeah, I'm sleep deprived. Yeah, <laughs> literally running a business that's pretty much a tech company. Like it's, you got enough demands on your life to, and they're still getting that in. So... <laughs> Yeah. So, so yeah, uh, no, that's cool. Cu curious question. You were mentioning your training there. I know you, uh, you did a marathon earlier this year. What, uh, what's in the cards for you for some of your, uh, athletic goals you're still chasing after or looking to knock off in the next while? Yeah, the marathon was in it. Well, I got my first 70.3 and first marathon this year. So it was nice. a big tick. And then we did a ultra the other day, which was a one called Bondi to Manly ultra, which was a DKs, but we did as a team but i decided to do leg three and part of leg four so i, I did 30 k's of that uh, which was good so i've sort of got the endurance bug uh it is very addictive i think and much to melissa my partner's disgust i think she's like god really 
<laughs> um, so I was going to do Bustleton 70.3 and uh, in December, but pulled out of that. I think that was a big relief for her and the kids. Uh, so next year, we were talking about as a team, as fuel in, maybe targeting St. George. Nice. 70.3. I hear it's a, a magic course and beautiful. So I think that would be really cool. Um, somewhere deep inside me wants to try and qualify for Taupo, but whether that's impossible or not, I'd have to significantly improve and ramp up my training. But uh, no, it's definitely, I think an American 70.3 is on the cards. Uh, cool. And then I think my time might have got me based on my age group into qualifying and I'm going to have a look at New York marathon. I want to do some more marathons, so it's not one and done. So maybe look at uh, trying to get into one of uh, one of the other races and see if I can do that. So that'd be cool. Um, I got I got my target, which was under 330, which was good. And so maybe try and get that down to 320 or something like that, which would be fun. So I'll probably have to lose a bit of weight, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, being 82 kilos is not ideal for uh, running marathons, I've decided. And anyway, it's like you going and putting on a 12 kilo weight vest <laughs> and going yeah, out there. That so would slow me it, down. That's for sure. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's certainly that. So. You got the power um, to back it up. I, I think you could, I don't think you'd have to shed that much. I have some, a couple guys who are in that upper seventies who can friggin' motor and have run like sub three hours and stuff like that. So I, I don't impressive. know if I fully subscribe to the, like, especially for something like around three hours or sub three, I think it's a different story. Maybe when you're getting in that like two thirty sort of area, but I've seen a lot of bigger dudes who can rip sub three. And I think it's, that's, I think it's a possibility. That? That's four minute K's, isn't it? Uh, four fifteen is sub is like a three That's hour quick. Like I don't know. Like I can do that there. for a while, but it's like yeah, I don't know. Maybe we'll see. So I think you'd, something, I think you'd go yeah. three thirty to three hour pretty quick. I, yeah, I maybe. I, I just surprised. need to run. Well, that was the first time I've ever run that. Day. I, actually, yeah. the marathon was the first time I've ever run over thirty two k's. <laughs> yeah. So it was like my um the seventy point three as well it was the second time I'd ever ridden ninety k's. <laughs> <laughs> uh so that was pretty funny everyone finds that like the athletes i work with they always find that funny when i tell them that they're like you yeah, said so you really probably should have done a little bit more biking i was like yeah so <laughs> but yeah no uh, i think things like that another marathon another 70.3 definitely on the cards um something in america obviously will be going to nice and uh kona next year and talpo for all the world champs to support athletes which will be very cool um i thought nice was amazing this year uh, I, I loved it. I thought it was spectacular. I mean, you can't find many better places than the South of France as well. So yeah. I thought it was really well organized. Um, I thought it was really great atmosphere. So it was buzzing. So if, I think anyone who, you know, is doubting whether it's, it's, you know, they want to get there for next year, I would say for all the women who have the opportunity to race in Nice next year, I would a hundred percent go uh, and then have a holiday in the South of France afterwards. Yeah, Perfect. that place is glorious. Yeah, we yeah, did it's beautiful. 2019 70.3 Worlds there, and it was such an amazing experience. That course was epic, and just the venue and vibes there were immaculate. Good stuff. 100%. 100%. Great food. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, Hopefully, yeah. I'll see you in Nice and Kona, ideally. We, yeah. We got, we got some work to do on our end to, to make sure we get there first. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, eventually. very good. We'll, we'll be there, so that'll be fun. Love it, man. Um, all right. Just final question for you. Um, how, what's the best way for people to, uh, follow along on your journey to, uh, follow all the things that you're up to and, uh, to get in touch with fuel. And if they're interested in, uh, in getting involved with that as well. Yeah. You can follow us on Instagram. So get fuel in, uh, is the hashtag and obviously check out our website, fuelin.com. Uh, we we'll probably give you, I don't know, some sort of we can give the listeners some sort of code discount, you know, cool. percentage off. Um, I'll talk to you about that afterwards. And if anyone's interested, they can just mention you. And uh, certainly, yeah, just reach out to us. You can reach out to scott at fuelin.com. I mean, yeah, we're a, a growing company, but we're still very personable. So, yeah, we do take the time to answer athlete questions and and respond. So, yeah, that's, that's sort of our belief is we want everyone to succeed. So. Amazing. Well, thanks again for the uh, catch up, Scott. It was great to uh, hear all things fueling. And I think there's going to be lots of goodies for people to take from this episode. So thanks again for uh, taking the time to chat with us on Endurance Icons. Thanks, Mark. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Wow. How great was that? I always learned so much from these Endurance Icons. 
If you enjoyed the podcast as well, please consider liking us across social media, subscribing to us on YouTube, or giving us a five-star rating on wherever you listen to your podcasts. We appreciate you and your support so much. We wish you happy training and we'll see you back next week.